My name is Justin, and I am an addict. I have been actively working the steps in the rooms of recovery since September of 2013, and am grateful to be sober one day at a time thanks to my God, the steps, and the fellowship of other addicts. RICO 12 is an organization with the mission of learning and sharing the similarities of addiction of all kinds and gaining and sharing tools and hope from others who are walking a similar path. Speakers from our past meetings have rep- represented many fellowships and identify with addictions with such a variety as alcoholism, drugs, food, sex, gambling, theft, just to name a few. Each Friday at noon central time, we hold a live lunch hour speaker meeting with a recovering addict from anywhere on earth pertaining to any or no faith tradition and with any background who shares their experience, strength, and hope on a spe- specified recovery topic of their choice. For the 12-week period that we started on March 4th of 2022 that will be going through May 20th of this year, we are focusing on each of the 12 steps of recovery. Our speaker today um, will share for 20 to 25 minutes on his experience, strength, and hope with step six, and then the live audience will get the opportunity to ask questions of him for another 20 to 25 minutes. Now, to get weekly invitations to join us to continue on this path of these steps or in the future as we revert back to our regular, any recovery topic that the speaker chooses to speak on, please send, um, please go to rico12.com forward slash join us and submit your email address there to get those reminders and links. Now, we do and are grateful for any donations and podcast ratings and reviews that we get here. Uh, information on how to do that will be in the chat of the live meeting and also in the show notes of the podcast. Um, if you're listening and feel that Rico 12 is of value to you, um, please, please take a few minutes and rate and review us in the podcast platform of your choice. It really does help us work our 12th step and get the message out there to other addicts. Um, we look forward each week to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now, a quick disclaimer on this series of the 12 steps. While we hope that these episodes will be helpful to both sponsors and sponsees alike, the next 12, these 12 weeks of episodes are not intended to replace the necessity of working with a sponsor through the steps. We will not be working the steps in these meetings. They are meant only to be a supplement and informative reference on what the steps mean and why they are important to the individual speaking about them. Now, step six reads, we're entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. And our speaker today is David G. David, here's a little bit about him. He's from Oklahoma, and he was the guest speaker at the 80th RICO 12 meeting back in December of 2021. And it was a great meeting, by the way. David was a sponsee of Charlie P. from Joe and Charlie and has been sharing experience, strength, and hope for 27 years. He had a miraculous and life-changing spiritual experience as the result of working this 12 steps outlined within the big book. He is a recovered sexaholic, lustaholic, alcoholic, and drug addict with a sobriety date of August 8, 1994, and is a grateful member of SA, AA, and NA. David learned he didn't know how to grow and develop his experience and soon found yesterday's miracle wasn't sufficient for today. After reaching an emotional bottom in sobriety, he learned that he suffered from a spiritual illness brought on by a human condition, self. He recovered emotionally in 2019 and has walked a free man ever since. As the founding member of the Freedom Seekers Group, David tries to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. The Freedom Seekers is an addiction-inclusive fellowship of sober and recovered men from drugs, alcohol, sex addiction, and more. The Freedom Seekers are growing in strength in numbers every day and are now up to 30 men within their lineage. His talk today on Step 6 is based on a quote on page 13 of Bill's story in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. Quote, I ruthlessly faced my sins and became willing to have my newfound friend take them away, root and branch. I have not had a drink since. David, the floor is yours. Take it away. All right, Justin. Thank you very much for uh, for asking me to be here today. Uh, and thank you, everybody who, who's come out uh, to attend this as well. My name is David G., and I am an alcoholic and an addict of many sorts. And I'm grateful by the grace of God to have a uh, sobriety day of August 8th, 1994, in Alcoholics Anonymous, and for that, I'm very grateful. 
That is because of a loving God that revealed himself to me through these 12 steps as outlined in the big book. I really didn't have much of a faith in God or anything else whenever I showed up here in August of 94. And because of a lot of years of addiction and a lot of years of alcoholism uh, and many, many tragedies that had happened in my life, I found myself um, placed in a uh, national rehabilitation center for Native American Indians. I am from Oklahoma. I am a member of the Choctaw tribe, and I'm very grateful for that. Um, after many years of trying to get sober and trying to get clean from drugs, sometimes many, many, many uh, times that I spent in jail, some time in prison as well. You know, I beat a man to death in, in my early days, and I was just an entire mess whenever I came to the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, I tried to get sober <clears throat> 10 years to prior, prior to getting sober. So in 1984, I, I started trying to get sober. It wasn't until 1994 that that miracle happened for me. And I ended up in the uh, rehabilitation center for, um, for Native American Indians. And at that, and at that point, I was um, able to be introduced to their ways and uh, their ceremonies uh, with the sweat lodges and the different things, uh, the vision quest and the different things that, that Native Americans do. There was one man there that was, uh, he, was, he was all AA, every bit of it. And uh, he knew the big book better than anyone that I'd ever met. And, you know, what happened was early on, I asked that man to become a sponsor in my life. And um, he began to guide me through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous and the directions therein. Now, about nine months into sobriety, after that many years of trying, I'd had two sons along the way. I mean, it's just, we all know that story. And the reason that I don't want to get too much into a story is because the narrative sets up a story and I'm the author of it. And I either put more into it or take more away from it. It turns out to be a story. And I listen to speakers and they get into a lot of stories and that's their business. That's okay. That's not me. I'm interested in one story, and that's the story of how many thousand men and women have recovered from alcoholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, as outlined in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. So my story falls along those lines. But quickly to qualify, after I'd been here for nine months, my youngest son, I had two two sons. My youngest son drowned in Lake Monroe, Indiana, and that was a devastating blow. It was, it was a terrible time for me. I was emotionally a wreck. I needed to drink. I needed something to use. And I thought I was craving alcohol and I was so completely mixed up on everything uh, that in the heat of the moment, uh, I had taken myself back to a liquor store where I was going to get a bottle that day and drank after nine months of sobriety because that had always been my pattern before. But by the grace of God and the help of the member who, who I was to contact that day. I was uh, given an adequate presentation to the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, and that absolutely changed my life. He, uh, he set me down. He showed me the difference between the program and the fellowship. I didn't know that. He showed me the difference between obsession and craving. So for nine months, I thought I'd been craving a drink all that time. That was not the case. According to our book and the doctor's opinion, the craving never develops until we put it inside of our body. At that point, a phenomenon of craving develops, and it demands more of the same. <clears throat> so I didn't know any of this coming in. And so I, I went through the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous with this man. I, man, I can remember we went through the doctor's opinion. He, he took me through the forewords and the doctor's opinion. And it showed me how that phenomenon craving sets up in, in people like us. And then the mind no longer has anything to say about it. Now, the mind will lead us to that. But it is not enough to take us away from that once we put it in our bodies. I know that to be the case today. This phenomenon of craving does not develop until I put it within. Because at 27 years, I could sit here right now wash my hands in a bowl of liquor, hold drugs in my hand, whatever it may be. And I promise you it wouldn't hurt me in the least. But if I put that in my mouth and swallow it down into my body, then I'm going to have a reaction that most normal people do not. I'm going to develop a craving, which is going to demand more of the same. And that had been my story for many, many years. So when I sit around in sobriety, and I think that I'm a, uh, craving alcohol, drugs, lust, sexual acting out, whatever it may be, that's not the case. I'm not fighting against the craving. I'm fighting against the obsession. And the obsession without a, a spiritual answer will always lead me back to whatever that is. Now, I'm convinced of one thing today. I didn't know that then. It doesn't matter what your addiction affliction is, whether it's alcoholism, drug addiction, sex addiction, whatever it may be, they all take off from the same airport, and that's self. And I did not know that that was the malady that had me defeated. Until I got into the book and I began to 
journey through that process. So what happened to me is in 1998, I met Charlie of Joe and Charlie, and Charlie was would become my very first mentor. Now, this full blood Native American, he he had taken me through the book, and I had I'd had a miraculous spiritual experience in 1995. But I didn't know what to do with that. Uh, no, you know, I, it was almost like I'd been taken from the bridge of reason to the shore of faith, and here I am. All of this stuff, everything's happening in my life. I'm no longer obsessing over alcohol or any of these things. You know, I, my life completely changed as a result of that spiritual experience that happened to me. Well, in a short time, <clears throat> one thing that the man never did show me was steps 10, 11 and growing in effectiveness and understanding with that condition. I never practiced that daily. And the book says we're headed for trouble because alcohol, lust, drugs, whatever it may be, is a subtle foe. And that's exactly what happened inside of the fellowship. By the grace of God, I never did return to alcohol and drugs again. But I reached one day for lust and not unconsciously not even knowing that I did that. That would become an, an addiction that I would have to fight for many years. Now, I didn't know at the time that I was a sex and lust addict. I didn't know that. And I didn't know that till recently. I was talking with the sponsor. I just I knew I had trouble in that area. Don't get me wrong. I knew that. That was very apparent. But what I didn't know was the addiction to that, and I didn't know that there was help from that. So for the next 25 years, that kind of behavior would follow me through my life. It, it robbed me of that experience. And as the book said, we're, we're headed for trouble if we do. So... <clears throat> You know, through the years, you know, I, I've done a lot of circuit speaking. I, I've worked the steps as outlined in the book many, many times in many different ways. The Red Road to Well Bride, Narcotics Anonymous, Alcoholics Anonymous, all of these steps, you know, and I'd take them over and over and over. And it'd bring temporary relief, but the insanity of lust would always return and I would act out again and again and again. And a lot of this was within the fellowship, sadly to say. And so in 2000, in, uh, 19, I really started reaching an emotional bottom with that. It had been going on for some time. And I really, looking back now, you know, uh, the thing that ever saved me really from going back to drugs and alcohol, because the book says at some point we will drink again, was my passion for the 12 steps as outlined in the big book and the willingness to carry the message therein. So in 2019, I ended up in a very bad place. I had stepped outside of my marriage. I had, uh, I had to have an affair with a girl uh, in the meetings and, um, and it really took me to an emotional bottom. I was discovered. Uh, somebody had turned me in to the, um, you know, to the area of Alcoholics Anonymous in Oklahoma. And it, it was just a big deal. All of this come crashing down on top of me and looking back today, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. So <clears throat> here's what happened. I, I came to Sexholics Anonymous. What happened? I was in the middle of the work and coming back through the steps and seeking relief. Now, I came through the fourth step and the fifth step, and I really understand why I wasn't having the outstanding peace in this that I've had through the years. It just wasn't happening to me this time. And when I got into amends, it's whenever I was discovered for all of this, and I really took a pretty nasty hit right there for a long time. But after doing the fifth step with a guy uh, from Cedar Rapids, Iowa, that is still my sponsor to this day, uh, him and and I and I have more than one mentor for sure. But anyway, he had listened to that fifth step and he told me, he said, David, you have a problem that Alcoholics Anonymous is not going to be able to fix. And that hit me in the gut unlike anything had ever had. And he said, you're going to have to find people that are just like you that can understand you because people in Alcoholics Anonymous are not going to talk about this. And if they do, he said, um, you know, it's going to be very quick. It's going to be a joke of some sorts, and they're going to laugh it off and move on. So you're going to have to find people of your own. And so I had been to SA one time before. I came in 2017, and I walked into the meeting that night, and I had a lot of judgment against those against those people. They knew, they knew nothing of the big book. They knew nothing of Joe and Charlie. They knew none of this. And I thought, I don't need to be here. I'm nothing like these men. I walked away with the, with the firm idea in my mind conviction that that I would never act out again in a short time. I was acting out again and went on a two-year hard relapse with lust and sexual acting out, which almost left a man dead from a gunshot. Uh, I'm a very violent, crazy whenever I get into that state of mind, whether I've got alcohol in me or not, I'm untreated. And I was at an emotional bottom and, and I was dying. I was dying. 
So in 2019, I come back to the rooms of Sexaholics Anonymous one more time with the ration of a drunken man. And this time I come in with a new attitude. It wasn't that I'm not like these people. I'm very much like these people. Now, they may not have the recovery I have, but they're free in an area that I'm not. I need that. And so there, one more time, I started going through their literature, the white book, the step into action book. But nothing could ever draw me away from the big book. That had always been my foundation. That has always been my first love. It will always be my first love. Is the big book about Alcoholics Anonymous. What happened to me was miraculous because <clears throat> I discovered in going through the work this time that self is what had defeated me all along. The book had been telling me that all those years. Self manifested in various ways is what had defeated us. So I look at the word self, I look at the word us, that's two different things. I'm not the self. The insanity of it is I believe I am. <clears throat> so where I first start getting a good look at this is from pages 60 to 61, which is third step directions. And I'm not here to talk about that today at all. But there's one sentence on page 62. A lot of people think that the third step prayer is the decision that we make and that we take. And that's the third step, but it is not. On page 62, 62, it says, this is the how and why of it. First of all, we had to quit playing God. It didn't work. It said, next, he said, that sounds like a decision to me. That hereafter in this drama life, God was going to be the director. Well, if God has not been the director up to this point, even though I thought he had, who has been? Well, it says I'm the victim of the deluded self and self-centeredness is my trouble, driven by hundred forms. So if I'm driven, I am definitely not the man behind the wheel, but you can bet I've been along for the ride. Now, I'm accountable for every action that I ever took, but I'm not responsible. Self, driven by self. It goes on to say this. We step on the toes of our fellows. We have made decisions based on self. That's the decision I always made. It told me what to do. It doesn't have arms and legs. It uses my active part, and here we go. When I get to inventory this time, I don't see who I am. I see who I've become based on a narrative that was given to me by self. And I've acted the part and here's the result of my life. So whenever I do step four and I finish up and I go through step five and at the bottom of it, where, where I take that hour alone, there's one promise in there that really jumps out to me. And it says, we will be walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. So moving forward in five, all the way to 12, according to this, I'm going to be walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe because now there's some things cleaned up on the inside of me that never was before. And uh, so it says we may have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now, now we've had a spiritual experience. So there's a transformation that takes place from a belief to now. I've been placed in a position today that's far beyond a belief. It's the now. Bill said, I simply had to believe in the spirit of the universe that knew neither time nor limitation, but that's as far as I'd went. And it was as far as I'd went too. So <clears throat> step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. There's only one short paragraph about that in the book. And so a lot of people say, how can you even share on that? Well, I really start getting a glimpse of this back in step four in the third column. In the first column, I list who? Second column, I list why, and then on the uh, in the fourth uh, in the third column, I really begin to look at the seven itself and how I've reacted to self. This is what I'm going to take with me into step six to ask to have removed. So the seven areas of self are self esteem, pride, ambition, security, personal relations, sex relations, and um, pocketbook. <clears throat> so. Definitions to these. Self-esteem. How do I feel about me? High or low? I either feel like the lowest scum on the earth or I feel so much above you. Self-esteem runs two ways, not just one. Pride. This is how I thought others saw or felt about me. Ambition. What do I want? Security. What do I think I need from others uh, for, to do for me so that I'll be okay? Uh, personal relationship. What demands do I put on others? Any relationship that doesn't include sex, sex relations. This is who I've hurt, threatened, injured, interfered with on the inside of me, a relationship I'm involved in, whether it's a real, imagined, or potential. And then pocketbook is finances, money, property, security, and material. So what he had me to do was to write underneath the second column each one of these and how it applied. But here's where he got me. 
he said, not only do I want you to write how this has affected you, I want you to look at what you do and what you have done when your self-esteem is threatened, when pride is threatened, hurt, injured, interfered with, ambition, security, any one of these, what do you do? Well, of course, I isolate, I bully, I lie, I cheat, I manipulate, I begin to dominate, I start wanting my own way and going to any lengths to get it. I will use fear. I will use money. I will use anything that I can. These are the things that I'm taking into step six with me. Now we can dress these up and call them anything that we want. I understand that, um, you know, they, they have many different names and that's all well and fine. But what about the, um, what about the behavior that goes along with them? That's what I'm more interested in taking a look at because this is what's going to have to change for me in step six. And when it says we were entirely ready to have God remove all of these, the one thing that that is, is according to the 12 and 12, is to be entirely ready is to aim at something that we're probably never going to reach, but that is something that we are to walk toward every day. And that's what I try to do, especially in steps 10 and 11 today. So whenever I get to the directions, After I take the hour with the fifth step, it says, if we can answer to our satisfaction, talking about the questions at the bottom of page 75, we then look at step six. He says, we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Am I now ready to let God remove from me all the things I've admitted are objectionable? Where did I admit that at? Well, step five, obviously. These are the things that are objectionable to my spirit. These are the things that block me off from the sunlight of the spirit. I'm not blocked off from the spirit. I'm blocked off from the sunlight of the spirit. I can walk outside at night on a pitch black night and I can look into the sky. I can't see the sky, but it doesn't mean the sky isn't there. It just means that I'm dark. I'm blocked from seeing that. And it's the same thing with these defects of character. So he asked me, am I now ready to let God remove from me all the things that I admitted were objectionable? So whenever I looked at columns three and four and the fear in my conduct inventory. I discussed them with another person. I knew exactly what I was bringing to step six. There was no, I didn't have to look for that. Some people say, you know, I have to try to figure this out or pray for it. No, we should know. Absolutely. At that point, it says, can he, can he now take them all? Every one. That's a question for me on the top of page 76 of big book. How big is this God that I've, come to know in these first five steps. I've learned this. <clears throat> the man that takes the first five steps will not be the same man that take the last seven. There's a transformation takes place from the ashes arises the new man. And that's what happened to me. I, you know, I began to see self. I started identifying the seven areas of self. I started looking at how my behavior is and how I react to these things. And as long as I don't ever take any action on them, they're just a thought. A thought without any action is just a thought. So in step 10, it continually tells us, turn your thoughts, turn your thoughts, turn your thoughts to someone you can help. And if you will do those things, then self is not that it ever goes away, but the volume gets turned way, way down. So the question, can he take them now, them all? Can he now take them all, every one? Absolutely he can. Where's my willingness going to be to let him do that? Now there are, there are, times that I absolutely, you know, fall short of this step uh, every day at times. Um, But I tell you, it's so much better than it's ever been because now I can see it. And in a nightly review, I get a chance to come back and clean that up. And so what a way of life that has become. Um, But there's a prayer here in the sixth step. And a lot of people don't notice this on page 76, but it is the sixth step prayer because it says, If we still cling to something that we will not let go, we ask God. And anytime I see those three words in this book, that's a prayer. We ask God to help us be willing. So my prayer became, God, give me the willingness to become willing to let this go, to let this go. I said that prayer for years with lust, and it came, but it came very ugly, and it came many years later. So that prayer is very effective. God, please help me to be willing. Give me the willingness to be willing. So. One of the other things with step six that I have learned is messengers will show up to give us opportunities to practice the step over and over. 
I've been hot headed for most of my life until, you know, I've outgrown so much of that now that's elementary to me anymore. I just don't do that, you know? And, uh, <clears throat> but one day I was at a convenience store whenever the gas prices just began to rise. And, uh, you know, I'd taken the vehicles down to get them filled up before it went any higher. And there were a couple of young men and a young lady outside of the convenience store. And, and one of them, he got to looking at me very strange. And, uh, I, I didn't know what was going on. I mean, they were young. I really didn't pay a whole lot of attention to it. But pretty soon he approached my car. And he told me, he said, um, you know, I, I noticed that you were looking at my girlfriend and I don't appreciate that very much at all. Now, I can honestly tell you there was a day that he had absolutely been right about that. I'd been guilty, but that day wasn't today. And uh, I just, no, no, you're wrong. Well, he didn't accept that answer and, and he started to get pretty violent. And, uh well, verbally not not physically and instead of pausing when agitated or doubtful asking for the right thought of the right action like i know to do i step out of the car and i engage in that and you know i just let him know this isn't going to turn out very pretty (laughs) for anyone and uh you know some other comments with it well it finally passed and i was on my way home when it when i realized what had been told to me messengers will show up and give you opportunity to practice this there was a messenger that day and uh, I fell short. I did. And that's okay. Here's what I've learned. God, please help me be willing to do better the next time this shows up because it's going to show up. Maybe not in that form, but some form or another. If I have these crazy thoughts, uh, you know, they're going to show up again. The book says when these crop up, not if, when. So they're coming again. Trust me. So what I've learned to do is turn to God and say, God, please help me to do better the next time this shows up. And then go on and and live my day and, and finish out my day without a bunch of guilt and shame and remorse and beat myself o- over something that self set me up to do anyway. It's almost like self sets me up to do it and then beats me up for doing it. And this went on for years and years. So I really discovered this and, and I started to break free of all this stuff right here. The transformation happened for me. And uh, less than a week later, I love keeping my yard looking like a golf course. Somebody had run through it with tracks. Oh, I was upset very much. So I was on my way home to find out who that was. When I heard that voice within say, that's another messenger. And I turned to prayer right then. And whenever I did, by the time I got home, it had worked itself completely out. I didn't have to fall into any of that. That day taught me <clears throat> that I need to practice this on a daily basis. So this is what I begin to do with step six. And this has really been a life changing process. At the end of step three, there is no amen. If you read that prayer on page 63, there is no amen at the end of step three. That amen doesn't come until on page 76 right here in, in the seventh step. And it says we have then completed that step. So the meetings I go to said you never complete the steps, but the book says that we do. So here's what I've come to learn with that. I've completed that body of work in steps three through seven. But I'm going to get an t- opportunity to practice this for the rest of my life in 10 and 11. So there again, we have emphasized willingness as being indispensable. Am I now ready to let God remove all of that from me? Absolutely, I am. Those things serve me no longer. I, you know, I see self. I, I know exactly who it is, what it is, when it starts, where it starts where it's coming from. I'm watching this all day long on a consistent base all the time. So I, I am, I'm so grateful for the instructions that are outlined in this book. I just know that emphasis, imp- the imposition of self is why I drank, use and act out to begin with. See, I didn't know any of this stuff before the book says each person is like an actor. It doesn't say he is the actor. It says he's like the actor. What I didn't realize is there was a different director directing my actions. All I needed to do was discover what and who that was, turn from that, turn to God, do the work as outlined in the book, continue to help others, continue going through this process. I read this book to people all the time. I've got 20 men in the work easily. My, my job allows me to do that. And uh, man, it has become a fellowship and a, and a life changing experience, not only for me, but a lot of other men in the family. So I know I'm at the bottom of the hour. I really want to thank uh, Justin for inviting me back to speak on this step. And uh, I'm really, really grateful to be sober. My relationship with my God today is the most important thing in my life. That has become the most beautiful thing. One thing I realize is this, and I'll close with this. There are two systems of thought. One is real. One is not. The doctor's opinion says we cannot differentiate the truth from the false. That's because of self. Today, I can. 
today I see what my true enemy is. It's not acting out. It's not drinking. It's not drugging. It's not any of those things. Those are the things I reach for to medicate these emotions buried deep within me that I don't even realize I had. And once I see this, then I begin to know that walking forward, I'm going to be walking forward with a new system of thought. That has really placed me in a position of neutrality, safe and protected, not from drugs and alcohol, but from self. I have recovered from a hopeless state of mind. Thanks, Justin. Glad to be here. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate your your share there, your perspective on things. And, and there were several things that came up that I just took notes on that I'll be asking for some clarification on here. But we'll also have questions from our live audience. Remember, to our uh, reminder to our live audience, if you have questions for David about step six or his experience in, in recovery, please type them in the Q&A link at the bottom of your Zoom, Zoom window. It looks like two speech bubbles over the top of each other. And we'll be happy to get to those. Now, I want to ask a question here that <clears throat> that you brought up something towards the end of your share here. And I'm going to put it in terms that I typically use. But you talked about, you know, I am a director in the play, I, or at least I try to be. Um, and, and to me, we've got the small D director, which is me when I'm trying to do it, and the capital D director, which is my higher power trying, that is actually needs to be that director. How, how do you differentiate in your day to day, day to day life as to which director is, is trying to run this play in your life? How do you recognize that in your life? Stress and trauma happen inside of the body, which means we can heal them through the body. My name is Luis Mojica. I'm a somatic therapist, nutritionist, and host of the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast. Join me each week as I teach you how to release stress and trauma through listening to your body, using nutrition, somatic experiencing, and other holistic practices. You can listen at the Holistic Life Navigation Podcast or at holisticlifenavigation.com. Absolutely. I... uh... Well, for one thing today, I know that isn't me. I, I, I know that I am the victim of the del, of a delusion. So, you know, I, I begin to really separate myself from our self, any of that. You know, I, I leave self where it's at. In fact, in the third step prayer, whenever it says, relieve me from the bondage of self, uh, I, I'm, for myself, I really ask to be relieved from the bondage of the idea that I am the self. And once I start to separate that, then I can begin to see self. And really through that third column and the work that I've done there in three and four, the way that I outlined that there, uh, really that gives me a way to take a good look at this. But really for me <clears throat> to answer your question is in step 10 when it says continue to watch for selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, fear. I add the word lust. And, and there's just, you know, five things there, a formula in that paragraph that I use daily. But I all of a sudden I'm watching for self I'm watching and it comes to me in my thinking in my thoughts and as long as it's just a thinking or a thought it's not it's not too bad but what happens is an emotion gets attached to it you know if I see something going on in my in my work and I become afraid usually my reaction is to act on that to try to manage that control it get it to go away whatever it may be um the same way with resentment, you know, I'm watching for anger. I'm watching for these things to come up daily. So for myself, you know, I really keep a good eye on that all day long in step 10. And then at night I come back with a nightly review to recap on it. And that's my experience of how I differentiate how self is coming in and how it's not. So. Thank you so much for sharing that. I also loved the examples you used and the, and the, the, the message you shared about, Hey, messengers will be sent to help you practice or help you recognize and, and practice with these character defects that, uh, that you have. And I love the two examples you shared with that. Are there any other examples of messengers that have come across your life that you've reacted to either poorly or, or well to that have been great teachers and helped you see um, your your character defects and you know that you're willing to surrender and, and be able to have them become more strength strong or at least more aware of them 
Yeah, absolutely. There, there are several, you know, usually a lot with coworkers or family or something like that, or even sponsees, you know, a lot of times we'll show up with things that, uh, that, that really kind of rub me the wrong way. And, but what I've learned instead of reacting to that now, you know, is, is I, as I take an action based more on a God sent life, uh, whenever I see that coming at me, um, one of the examples was, you know, I, I was in a pretty heated conversation with my boss one day. And um, I noticed that resentment was beginning to come on there. And I was starting to feel that on the inside of me. And I knew exactly what it was. I knew it was self-manifesting in various ways there. And uh, that day, it just happened to be through him. <clears throat> and so what I'd done was I, I said, look, you know, I'm in a bad area where there, there's bad reception. And, and there was. I said, I need to back away from this conversation for a couple of minutes. And, and so that's what I did. I, I pulled back. I asked God to remove that to me. You know, I discussed it with somebody in a 10 step pretty quick. And um, the book says to turn my thoughts to someone I can help. So here's what I ended up doing. I turned my thoughts to washing his car for him. The book doesn't say I have to help anyone. It says I need to turn my thoughts to helping someone. So he lives in Kansas. I'm in Oklahoma. That's about a 300 mile difference there. And so the chances of me ever washing his car that day or any day are probably slim to none. But like it said, I don't have to do that. All I need to do is turn my thoughts in that direction. And that's what I've done. I turned my thoughts to doing that so he could take a family trip, his kids, and then would be in a clean car. This, this, this. When I did it, took the power out of the resentment. Self, I see it. I've got eyes on it now. I, I don't have to react to that. And sometimes I do. And when I do, I'm making amends quickly if I owe one. But more than that, I don't beat myself up over that. The one thing that I do do is ask God to show me how to do better the next time this occurs, because it's going to. It most definitely is. So, you know, that's one example of many. But, you know, it's these things, uh, these messengers, they they show up in a lot of different ways. The dog may be barking at night, wake me up in the middle of the night or something. Yeah. Oh, man, that's a big one. You know, or. If someone messes with my pocketbook, that, that's a very big one. You know, if I do work and I don't feel like I'm uh, properly uh, taken care of for that reason or whatever, that's one that 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 I've really had to keep an eye on. And today I just, you know, I, I simply don't get in an argument so much about that as I tell them, hey, if you want more from me, I want more from you. That's that's just how it is. And, uh, you know, I, I don't mind giving all I got, all that you want, but but I want that from you as well. And, uh, you know, we've come to an understanding on that now, whereas before I would hold that within, not say anything, go ahead and do the job anyway, and then be completely irate about it, talking all this smack to other coworkers about them that got back to, it was just a huge mess. Self kept me running in a circle all the time. Those behaviors don't exist anymore. A blessing. Thank you for sharing that. We have a, a question that came in from one of our live audience members. Ashley asks or says first and then asks a question. Thank you for sharing your story about step six, David. Earlier, you mentioned vision quests and sweat lodges. Can you tell us more about those and how they enhanced your recovery? <clears throat> Absolutely can. That that was one of the very first things I, that happened to me the last time that I showed up at, at the uh, at the rehabilitation center for native americans they, they had talked about a sweat lodge and i really didn't know what that was and um you know i didn't know that it was spiritual for one thing i didn't know any of that was and, and i showed up that day and i, and I really had a life-changing experience with the sweat lodge and really what that is it's, it, it's a small dome that's made out of willows everything is is cut and carved and you know you wrap it with blankets and a canvas tarp and, you know, you have a fire that burns on the outside of it about 15 foot away with, with many hot rocks. And you bring those in with a pitchfork on the inside and you place them in, in a little pit on the inside and you close that up and then you use water, which creates a steam and you begin to sweat. And as you sweat, you pray, you meditate, you pray, you meditate. And what happens is you have an experience, body, mind, spirit, body, mind, spirit. And that has been a part of my recovery now for 27 years. I, I sweat within that first week. And uh, man, what a life changing experience. And the vision quest was, was something that's a little different. You know, that's where you go on a quest and, um, uh, you know, all of these different visions, you, you fast as you go. And for me, you know, I, I was taken to a secluded place, dropped off and then come back, you know, uh, about four days later, uh, you, 
you really don't eat anything other than what you kill. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, there's quite a bit there, but, but really what I'm looking to do is, is to get a vision. And this really t- goes along with the last uh, chapter in our, in our book there uh, of the first 164 pages of vision for you. And so the vision quest is a very powerful experience. The sweat lodge as well. That's something that I continue to do to this day. In fact, I, I was, I, I'd done one recently. I was planning to do another one uh, this next coming up week. We do several of them. I've sweat with many, many different tribes and most all of those people are in recovery. They have found forgiveness and healing through the sweat and, it, it absolutely connects to the 12 steps as written by our earliest members. So if you ever get a chance to do that, please do, because it is a beautiful, beautiful experience. Not everybody takes to it because it does get pretty hot as time goes on. It's like cooking a frog. You start slow, but as long as you don't turn the heat up on him too much, he can endure. So and, until he's cooked anyway. So anyway, thanks for asking that question. A higher consumption of vegetables may cut your odds of developing depression by as much as 62%. An American Cancer Society study found that women who sit for more than six hours a day have a 40% higher death rate. Hi, my name is Maya Acosta, and I'm a health and wellness educator and host of the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast. Join me and the amazing people that I get to talk to as I set out to learn how to improve our quality of life and increase our longevity. You can listen at the Healthy Lifestyle Solutions podcast or at healthylifestylesolutions.org. Yeah, thank you. And that is something that intrigues me. So if I ever get the opportunity, I, I look forward to taking that opportunity. Absolutely. Um, the, the, the title, the working title of this presentation is Root and Branch Taken Away. Um, my experience is that, you know, when I am being pruned by my higher power, by life, by the experiences in my life, it's a painful experience. And sometimes it hurts really bad. Um, talk to us a little bit more about that pruning process of root and branch and becoming a new a new person and with a new heart, whatever that looks like to you. Talk to us a little bit more about that, please, David. Absolutely. My experience with that is in 2019, I was being pruned <laughs> and, uh, and I do know, you know, from being native American and loving the outdoors and loving nature that anytime that you have a tree that, that is very fruitful, but it has a lot of dead branches on it, those need to be taken down and cast into the fire, so to speak, because they're really no longer any good. Now for years, I thought I was the branches, but I'm not, uh, you know, come to find out. And so as I was being pruned for that, uh, and I really didn't know that's what it was at the time, I was really beginning to, in my spirit, uh, I was just really starting to feel so choked out, so empty on the inside that there was just really nothing left anymore. And I knew something was happening, but I just didn't know what had happened. And Bill said in his story, much moved. Now, I always thought that man outside, he was outside the cathedral and a bunch of cars were running. No. He's talking about on the inside, much moved because he comes back to that experience over and over, you know, in, in his story, especially toward the end of it. For me, what happened was the lies, the manipulation, the secrets, all of the different things that was going on in my life at the time. Those were slowly, slowly starting to be cut away. And I didn't like it. It was very painful. Uh, and I was very afraid. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was going to happen with my family. Uh, the only fellowship that I'd ever known, uh, you know, I, I'd hurt so many people there that, and I was so shameful and guilty. I didn't want to go back. I mean, all of these things hit me in 2019 in a motel room in Shreveport, Louisiana, whenever I was completely discovered. And, you know, with all of that that happened, I still would not get honest. It was just in piecemeal that I would come out with different parts of information. This went on for about another week or so. And at the end of that next week, I was moved into a corner to where I had no choice but to tell the truth. And that day, they, they, they was taken away, root and branch. You know, the branches had been coming off all along. That day, the root come out. So for me, You know, it it was finally becoming completely honest. What happened to me in that motel room was was really kind of strange because I'd had 
I, I just felt like I was burning up on the inside all the time. I, I'd take my temperature to make sure that I didn't have a crazy fever, and I didn't. But I was just burning up on the inside all the time, and I, I just couldn't understand what was going on with me. I just, well, I'm sick, I'm this, I'm that. And I got down there that night, and whenever I ended up opening up about this, and it absolutely crushed me on the inside to have to sit there and, and tell a lady that I had been married to for that many years who had been low and faithful exactly what I had done in the night. Sometime there was a sweat that broke from me, almost like being in that lodge. It soaked that bed entirely. Now I didn't really realize that until I woke up the next morning, took a shower, went on back to the conference, finished the big book study. But she had told me later on that she'd sit on the edge of the bed to put her shoes, boots on, whatever it was. And that that sweat was so bad that it soaked the bottom of her jeans there where she'd sit on that side of the bed. So when I look, think of, you know, root and branch, it being taken away, root and branch. I mean, it's almost like that's what that looked like for me. It was uh, pretty horrific at the time. I look back on it today as, as a huge blessing, but not then. So. Yeah, and I love what you said it, it, towards the beginning of this. Well, I love the whole answer there. But you said, you know, I thought that those branches were me, but I learned that they weren't. And yes. then you touched on, you know, those branches may be lies, character defects, whatever they are. Talk about that just a little bit more. The difference between me and the branches that are being pruned and the roots that are being pulled out. Well, self manifested in various ways is what had defeated me. Um, one of the other things I'd like to uh, share with you right, right quick here is the, the characteristics of self and, um, uh, there, there's there's four basic characteristics of self, and I didn't know that. <clears throat> and this is kind of what that looks like you know, pertaining to your question. And see, all this time I thought this was me. Now, when I say that, and I have people tell me all the time, David, don't tell people that. Don't tell them they're not responsible. But we're not. I mean, we are accountable absolutely for our actions. We were there. We played the part that we were given, but we didn't direct the part. Self did. So when I look at the four characteristics of self, one is the victim. I always, always thought, keyword, thought I was a victim. I blame others or I beat myself up or I lie to myself about myself. All of this stuff comes at me. I act. Next one is the noticer. I either lustfully look at someone, I'm noticing the negative in others or myself all the time. I have a thought, I take action based on that thought, and then I beat myself up for days for having that thought. This is an endless cycle over and over and over. So one is victim, two is the noticer, three is the scorekeeper. This is what I hold on to others, their mistakes and mine. I really, really have to quit playing God, the book says. And of course, the last is the judge, jury, and the executioner. And this is where I try to punish others, and then I end up punishing myself for others. So I think, I don't think I know that the tree is, is who I've always been. The branches that are dead are all of these things right there. These, this is what has to go. When this goes, and, and a great teacher said it in this way in the Bible. He said, as a man thinketh, so is he. And that's good or bad. And, and I do know that today to be the truth. Um. <clears throat> You know, in my bio, what is put down there is I realized I suffer, suffered from a spiritual illness brought on by a human condition. And on page um, um, 64 of our book, <clears throat> it says, being convinced that self manifested in various ways is what had defeated uh, us. There's self and us, the two different things. We considered its common manifestations. It says resentment is the number one offender. It, talking about resentment, which is a common manifestation of self, destroys more alcoholics, sexaholics, lustaholics, gambling, whatever, than anything else, even alcohol, drugs, lust, any of that. It destroys us quicker than any of it. it. But the book says from it, talking about resentment, which is a common manifestation of self, stem all forms of spiritual disease. I'm not spiritually sick. There's no way that I am. Self 
has convinced me of that. But if I read this very closely, it's telling me the reason that I have a spiritual disease is because I suffer from a human condition called resentment, which is a common manifestation of self. And this has me blocked and I can't even see it. So it says not only have we been mentally and physically ill, we have been spiritually sick because of resentment, because my spirit's sick. And I had that backwards for so long. When that is overcome, I straighten out mentally and physically. And once I seen that for what it truly was, then I knew I was not the branches. I was the tree. I am the witness of those things today. So, yeah. Thank you so much, David, for expounding on that. That really opens my eyes to a lot of things. And I opened up my big book to follow along and took a couple of notes there that in places that I had not put that, uh, made that connection before. So thank you for expounding and, and helping me see that. Um, I've got one more question before we get into a, you know, a words of wisdom and wrap up here. Um, the question I have, you, you talked and, and, and you hit on that, the accountable accountability versus responsible. But what I want to talk about is the obsession versus the craving. Why is it so important for, for, for me or anybody else to understand the difference between the obsession and the craving? And why is there, I mean, is it important to really understand that difference? You know, it absolutely was for me because for so long, I thought that I was craving a drink so badly and I would relapse or I would act out again and again and again. And I would come back and I would just say, you know, the craving, the temptation was so bad that, that I couldn't take it anymore. And I can remember talking to a man one day and, um, you know, he really pointed out the difference before me. I think the doctor's opinion is put in the place in the big book for a reason. It, it says, you know, it explains it many things for which we could not otherwise account. It talks about, you know, being maladjusted to life, full flight from reality, outright mental defects. He says these things were true to some extent and to a considerable extent with most of us. But he says, but. And that changes the entire paragraph. But we are sure that our bodies are sick as well. I don't need to go to a doctor or read a book to know that I'm mentally sick when I show up in these fellowships. I know that. I mean, I'm, I'm crazy. I'm not stupid. But what I don't know is there is something going on with my body. My mind will trick me into believing it's okay to do just one. We're going to take the edge off. You know, work's been a little hectic. Wife's on a rampage. We're just going to have one. That's it. No more. We're not getting to where we were before. But what I don't know is once I put that inside of my body, it's going to trigger an allergic reaction that's going to demand more of the same over and over and over. And when I do that, I set up a phenomenon of craving. I absolutely cannot stop until I'm sick, drunk, and in all kinds of trouble. I drink and use till I absolutely have to stop. I'm in jail. I'm beat up, beat up bad. And then my mind's going to trick me into doing it again. And then I'm going to drink and use and act out and act and act that until I absolutely have to stop. And then it's going to run in reverse. And this is repeated over and over. And the doctor says, unless we can have an entire psychic change, there's very little hope of recovery. So yeah, there's a big difference there in those two for me. Thank you so much, David. And uh, this has been really, really good. Do you have any final words of wisdom for us before we start closing this out? Well, the one thing that I would like to say that I always say that anything that I have said here today that that your sponsor has told you something different about, your sponsor is absolutely correct. Don't listen to me. Listen to your sponsor. That's who you're accountable to. Your values, not mine. If your reading and understanding of the book is somewhat different than mine, that's okay. That that that's your experience. This is mine. But this is my experience on uh, based on many years of experience with this book and with these fellowships. I have found a way not only to get sober, but to recover. If you're new or relatively new or you're coming back uh, from a relapse, you know, th there was a, a saying that I used to always say, and it was, uh, you know, for those still out there, please, God. For those coming back from relapse, thank you, God. And for those of us here today, it's because of the grace of God. And I always, <clears throat> you know, stick to that. But if you're new or relatively new, please. Just don't give up before the miracle happens. Find somebody who is grounded in the big book or, or one of the fellowship books that can take you through the steps, outline what the problem is. The problem is not alcohol. It's not drugs. It's not acting out. If that's the case, just stop. There shouldn't be any more problem, right? But every time we stop, there's something up here between our ears that shows up and it's mad and it's angry and it's upset. 
and uh, it's going to react in all kinds of ways until I put something in my body to make it stop. And when I do that, I'm going to set up a craving beyond my mental control, and I'm going again and again and again. So this information is vital. There is a solution here. Our book doesn't say this is the solution. It says there is a solution. There's many solutions for many different people. But for us, people like us, most of us, this is the solution. And it's here. It's in the book. Uh, the fellowship is a wonderful thing. I have to have it. Page 17 of the book tells me that's uh, a common peril, uh, you know, but that by itself would have never held us as we're now joined. The tremendous fact for every one of us is we've got a way out. And those words right there attract me. If you got a way out, I want it. Show me what it is. And the very next sentence says, that's what the book's about. You know, so, yeah, a tremendous fact for every one of us. And uh, it, it is a tremendous fact. So any newcomers, you know, please, uh, you know, and feel free. Reach out to me. Uh, I can connect you. No, no matter, you know, by the grace of God, I suffered from all those different afflictions. I've got to contacts in every every twelve step fellowship that there is. We can we can get you help if you're willing. So, thanks a lot, Justin. Glad to be here today. Awesome. Thank you so much, David. Uh, that was a great Rico Twelve weekly speaker meeting for all addicts and those wanting to learn more about addiction and the recovery therefrom. If we didn't get to your questions or if you have other questions, please go to rico12.com forward slash forum and join in our community there and ask those questions and others that may come up. I invite you all to come back next week. If you've not already rated and reviewed the podcast and Apple podcast, please go do so now. It's a great way to work your step 12. Next week, we will be doing step seven and John R will be our speaker. And he's, uh, he's excited to share about his step seven experience and it should be a great meeting. I look forward to seeing you all back here then. Now let's launch off into the rest of our day with a closing prayer that David will be voice for. Go ahead, David. Thank you one more time, Justin. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. God, please remove the veil that I may see what is really happening and not become intoxicated by stories and fears. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Amen. Thank you. Keep coming back, everybody. It works when I work it, so work it. You are worth it. Searching for glimmers of 